So we're going to talk today about the gases that are in your blood as a result of either internal and external respiration or cellular respiration. So all of the processes that are exchanging gases result in oxygen and CO2 being carried by your blood. So this picture sums it all up. Of course, I'm going to give you more details about each section. The place I'm going to start is right here. Now, obviously, this is not an anatomically correct diagram. What we're representing in this diagram is that a bunch of blood vessels at some point get blood that went past your lungs. And then those blood vessels eventually end up at tissues. This is cells, any cell or organ in your body. So we're being very generic here because the process is the same no matter which cell in particular we're talking about. The idea that we'd like to get across is that blood brings oxygen from your lungs to your cells and then blood brings CO2 from your cells to your lungs. So that's why lungs are at one side of the picture and cells or tissues are at the other side. Now you'll also notice on my diagram there's a color uh, and that's because fairly typically when we draw diagrams we would represent blood vessels that have oxygen as red. So this side would for the most part represent arteries. The other side would represent veins. Now we're going to talk about circulation in our next chapter and go into a lot more detail about arteries and veins, but as a general rule, arteries have oxygenated blood and veins don't. There's an exception to it, but we'll do that in the next chapter. Arteries are generally going away from your heart and towards your tissues. Veins are coming back to your heart, and so that's how you can differentiate them as well. Now we know that at your lungs something is happening. At your lungs, we already saw, we have external respiration. That means that gases are being exchanged. The gas that is coming in is oxygen and the gas that is going out is CO2. So oxygen comes in, CO2 comes out. So once oxygen comes into your lungs and it's going to be exchanged into your bloodstream, we have to talk about how your blood carries oxygen around. So you'll notice that this first little spot up here where it says O2 and it's pointing towards the bloodstream has 1% next to it. That's because about 1% of the oxygen that you breathe would be dissolved in plasma. So that means there's no special molecule that's picking it up or carrying it around. It will simply dissolve in the liquid part of your blood. So plasma is basically the water part of your blood. So that's where a small, small percentage of oxygen is found, dissolved in plasma. All of the rest of the oxygen that comes from your lungs and diffuses into your bloodstream uh, will then be picked up by a molecule. This molecule is represented as a circle, and I'll just draw it a little bit bigger so you can really see. A circle with four sections, and each section has Fe in it. Now this molecule that's represented by the big circle is hemoglobin. Hemoglobin is a protein. We already saw what proteins did and we even mentioned this protein way back at the beginning. Hemoglo hemoglobin is a transport protein. It carries oxygen around. And the way it carries oxygen is by having iron attached to it. Now there's a little bit more detail to it than that. There's little subgroups. But the basic idea is that every hemoglobin has four irons. 
and oxygen is attracted to iron. And so this will help one hemoglobin carry around four molecules of oxygen. Now when it is oxygen that is being carried, we will call this oxyhemoglobin, representing that it's hemoglobin with oxygen attached. And like it says, 99% of the oxygen that's being transported in your body is attached to hemoglobin. So we'll mention this again when we talk about blood specifically, but there are a few conditions that affect levels of hemoglobin. For example, if you are anemic, it means you don't have enough iron, and not having enough iron means that you wouldn't be able to carry as much oxygen around. At the end, it shows oxygen leaving your bloodstream, and very specifically, we're talking about oxygen going to myoglobin in your muscles so that it could be used to perform cell respiration. Oxygen can also be dropped off at any other type of cell, not just a muscle cell. We're mentioning muscles specifically because they have myoglobin, which is another protein. Once we get to cells, then cell respiration happens. So at this point in the diagram, we have cellular respiration. That means that oxygen is going to be converted to CO2, uh, as well as glucose being converted and us having some water. But we're going to focus just on the gases. So at this point, oxygen is being used, CO2 is being produced. So we need to ask ourselves, where is the CO2 going? On the left side then, now we're in our veins, 7% of CO2 is dissolved in plasma. So it's a little bit more than oxygen. Now in terms of these percentages, I'm not going to ask you a question where I say, uh, is it 6 or is it 7% of CO2 that's dissolved? That would be mean. I want you to get the big picture. Is it a lot or is it a little? This is a relatively small amount. The next point where we could talk about CO2 is on this same four-sided molecule, our same molecule of hemoglobin, but now CO2 is going to be attached. This is called carb amino hemoglobin. It's still hemoglobin. It's a protein that has four sections. Each section has an iron. But the beginning changes. Instead of it being called oxyhemoglobin, because oxygen is attached, it's called carb amino hemoglobin. The carb stands for carbon. The amino stands for nitrogen. Now, the chemistry of the process isn't something that I would ask you, but there's a reaction that can happen where carbon dioxide and nitrogen are put together in a molecule. Things happen chemistry-wise. Uh, and instead of it being CO2, now it's an ion that has carbon and that has nitrogen in it. You'll see it represented here, NHCOO negative. I'm not expecting you to know this chemistry detail. I'm just showing you that's where the name is coming from. Now, the rest of the carbon dioxide, so this would be the main way that carbon dioxide is carried, is up here where it says 70%. Let's give myself some space. And this is bicarbonate ions. Bicarbonate is HCO3 negative. It's a pretty common ion. If you took science 10, I guarantee you had to write it. Uh, it's actually called hydrogen carbonate. Bicarbonate is its more common name. Uh, it's what's in baking soda. So this is a fairly common ion. Bicarbonate ions are the result of CO2 reacting with water. And since your blood is made up of a bunch of water, this makes total sense. CO2 reacts with water, and you end up getting a bicarbonate ion. 
And that's how the majority of carbon dioxide is transported, is in the form of that ion. So we're going to talk about the regulation of breathing. Now breathing is one of the few things that is under both voluntary and involuntary control. That means that you can control breathing to some extent, but the default setting would be involuntary. It happens all by itself. That means that there are a lot of smooth muscles involved in breathing, but that there are also skeletal muscles as well, because you can have some control. Now, it's a combination of the two. So you cannot control your breathing 100% of the time. Sometimes it just happens. But like any other thing that has to do with muscles, if you practice, you can become better at controlling your breathing. So here's the basic idea. You have things called chemoreceptors, a receptor that detects a chemical molecule. And they are found in your medulla oblongata. Now, if I were to look at your brain, and I were to take this little chunk here and look at it sort of sideways, it's what we call the brain stem. Now, this is not part of Biology 20. This is just me loving the brain and knowing stuff about it. Your brain stem is the bottom part of your brain. It's called the brain stem because it literally looks like the stem, and then your brain is like the flower that goes over the top of it. Uh, but in your brain stem, you have a few pieces. The medulla is in the middle. Uh, that's where it gets medulla from. Uh, but the medulla is just a piece of the stem of your brain. Uh, and this is where a lot of automatic functions are controlled. So it's not just breathing. Uh, it's most of the things that happen automatically. They run through this part of your brain. Uh, so what are they sensitive to? They're sensitive to CO2 and hydrogen. Now, the CO2 makes tons of sense. That's what you get as a byproduct of cellular respiration. Where do the hydrogen ions come from? They come from the reaction that produces bicarbonate. So when CO2 dissolves in your blood, it reacts with water, and you get bicarbonate, but you also get hydrogen ions. So this way, your brain can detect CO2 in its actual gas form just dissolved, but it can also detect bicarbonate production. Uh, so it's got the two main ways that CO2 is transported. So what happens if the concentrations of these two chemicals in the blood increases? Well, some things are going to be stimulated. Now, there'll be some other secondary effects. Uh, in other organ systems, we're going to focus on the respiratory ones. But the first thing that will happen is that the diaphragm and intercostal muscles will contract. That's the main respiratory effect. If the brain senses high levels of CO2 or hydrogen, it will stimulate your diaphragm and your intercostal muscles to contract, which leads to inhalation. And it will do this with increasing speed. So you should be breathing all the time. What will happen when your medulla oblongata senses higher CO2 concentrations is that now your rate of breathing will increase. And your muscles will be stimulated more often and more frequently so that the speed of breathing uh, increases. <coughs> 
Now this picture down here, which shows what your brain is attached to, uh, is indicating all sorts of places that your medulla is getting these signals from. So we're sensing CO2 and hydrogen, but it's also sensing things from your lungs. For example, are your lungs stretched or are they flat? And that can contribute to how heavily you breathe. They detect what's going on in your muscles, and that sends signals to your brain. There are also, on the periphery of your body, so not in the central part, not in your brain, but in the periphery, like in your blood vessels, there are other receptors there. And then there are higher brain things. Your feelings, your emotions can have an effect on your rate of breathing. So you can think about something scary and it might make you start to breathe more heavily. You can be nervous about something and it might make you breathe more heavily. So the chemoreceptors in your medulla oblongata are the main place that detects levels of CO2 and tells you to breathe, but there are also lots of other factors that would contribute to it. And this is true for most things. We'll focus on the main reason, and that's the one I would expect you to know about specifically. But if you were ever writing, say, a written response, keep in mind that's not the only thing that determines whether or not you breathe. Uh, does anyone have any questions that they want to ask about control of breathing? <laughs> 